Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the macrolide antibiotics. So, at the moment we're in the process of discussing the process of translation. We are revising our molecular biology and then we'll discuss how the macrolide antibiotics uh, actually work to block this process and therefore block protein synthesis. So, so far we've created this 30S pre-initiation complex, which is this, um, this um, 30S ribosomal subunit with the initiation factor 1 and the initiation factor 2 and this guanosine triphosphate molecule bound to it, along with an mRNA molecule bound and the first um, amino acid, amino acyl tRNA as it's called, bound in place, which is the one which has uh, formal methionine uh, bound to it uh, and has the complementary anticodon to the start codon. Okay, right. What now happens is another subunit is going to come along and bind here. So the next thing that's going to happen is you're going to bring in the 50S ribosomal subunit, which is bigger than the 30S ribosomal subunit. So what's going to happen is you're going to add on the 50S ribosomal subunit. And when you add it on, what's going to happen is the initiation factor 1 and 2 are going to cleave off. And the GTP is going to be hydrolyzed to GDP and inorganic phosphate. So what you're going to get here is, here's the 30S ribosomal subunit from before. Here's our mRNA sitting in position. Here's our formal methionine tRNA here with the formal methionine at the end. And now what's going to come and happen is the 50S ribosomal subunit is going to come and bind here. Whoopsie. Okay, so here is the 50S ribosomal subunit. So, let me highlight things up. 30S, we have this pink colour denoting the 30S ribosomal subunit. What colour should we use to now to denote this other subunit, this 50S subunit? I think we'll use, not orange, we'll use green. Okay, so in green here, this is the new subunit that has come and joined on. This is the 50S ribosomal subunit. Okay, so this is 50S here. 50S ribosomal subunit. Okay? So they have combined together to make the full what's known now known as the 70S ribosomal subunit. And of course, 50 and 30 don't add up because they're not just mass. Uh, they are a more complicated measure. They do measure size, but they measure it in a more complicated way than just mass. Okay, so this is 70S. Um, okay, right. Uh, the 70S ribosome now. Okay. And in fact, what it's known as the, is it the 30S ribosomal initiation complex is what we've actually formed to give it its full name. Right, okay, so what has happened when the 50S ribosomal subunit came and bound is now the initiation factor 1 and initiation factor 2, they've gone off, they've cleaved off, so they're over here, let's say. Okay, in addition, that GTP molecule that we have bound up here, remember, this GTP molecule here, that's hydrolyzed, and it's now uh, been broken down into guanosine diphosphate, GDP, and an inorganic phosphate molecule, so PI here. Okay, right. Uh, now, uh, what else can we highlight up here? So, still in position here, we have our uh, formal methionine tRNA, which is bound, remember, to this start codon in turquoise here on the mRNA, and the shine dalgano sequence is still here in orange, which is bound to the 30S ribosomal subunit. I will also just colour in the initiation factors in their appropriate colours. So here's 1 and 2, in initiation factor 1 and 2 in blue. Okay, and finally we'll just put, um, we'll leave GDP and inorganic phosphate colourless. Right, okay, so now we need to discuss some important things about this 50S ribosomal subunit. Basically, the mRNA runs in between the 30S and the 50S subunits. The um, 
amino acid, sorry, the t amino acyl tRNA as it's called. So this specifically is a formalmethionine tRNA. But more generally, we're going to have amino acyl tRNA. So I'll write that down somewhere. I'll write it here. Amino acyl tRNAs. So these just mean, uh, basically, tRNAs with amino acids um, joined onto them via their carboxylic acid groups. So we've looked at a specific example of an amino acyl tRNA, where we have this formalmethionine tRNA. But there's going to be tRNAs for all the other amino acids as well, for every possible anticodon that you can come up with. And there's going to be quite a few of those, because there are four things you could put here, four things you could put here, and four things you could put here. So there's four times four times four possible anticodons that you can dream up. So there's 64 anticodons, so 64 different tRNAs. Now, not every tRNA has a different amino acid joined to it, because that would mean that there would have to be 64 different amino acids, and actually there's only around 20 of them that are actually used in proteins. So some um, um, tRNAs will have uh, the same, um, same amino acid joined to them, even though they have different anticodons, basically. So there will be degeneracy in the genetic code. Okay, right. So, the ribosomal subunit here, well, the ribosome here, the 70S ribosomal initiation complex, this has sites within it where um, amino acyl tRNAs can sit. And there are three different sites, basically. There is what is known as the P site, which is currently where this formalmethionine tRNA is sitting. Okay? So, this is the P site here. There is another site neighbouring this, which we'll draw here, okay, known as the A site. And then finally, there is another site over here, known as the E site. So these are just holes, basically, within the ribosome, spaces within the a ribosome, where tRNAs can sit and bind with uh, their codons on the mRNA, basically, that's sitting in between these two subunits. Okay, now, what do these, uh, each of these um, sites stand for? Well, a nice way of remembering it is APE, A-P-E. So, A is the site where the amino acyl tRNAs are going to enter the ribosome. P is called P because it's nearby the peptidyl transferase enzyme. So down here there is an enzyme that's going to be very important in a moment called peptidyl transferase. Okay, so that's why that's known as the P site because it's nearby the peptidyl transferase site, uh, enzyme. Okay, so let me just highlight up this peptidyl transferase enzyme. So in yellow here, which probably won't show up, but in yellow here, is the peptidyl transferase enzyme. Right, and then the E site is the exit site where uh, amino acyl tRNAs are going to leave the uh, 70S ribosomal complex. Okay? Right, so, we're now ready to begin the process of elongation of this uh, polypeptide. We're now ready to actually begin the process of translation. Right, so, uh, let's turn over the page and discuss, well actually let's discuss here what's going to happen and then we'll, dis we'll draw the next picture on the next page. So, we have seen this first codon here. This first codon was AUG. So look at this picture up here. The first codon of the mRNA was this start codon. But the mRNA goes on basically, it continues on over here. And there will be another codon following this AUG. Okay, so let me go over to the other side and continue drawing this. So, if this is our piece of mRNA, here was our start codon, A, U, G. Now, once you've started, then you have to continue, basically. You have uh, put your first um, amino acyl tRNA in now, and there's, there's going to be another codon down here as well, so there's going to be another free organic bases that follow this. So let's give an example. G, G, C, maybe, might be our next codon, which I've just totally made up, okay? So this is our second codon, which I'll write in orange here. Okay, so this is the second codon. 
Now, this second codon will be in the position of the A site of our uh, ribosomal complex. Let me draw the picture of the ribosomal complex again, rather than just flitting back and forwards between the, this side and the other side. So here is our mRNA, and it's now in between these two ribosomal subunits, the 30S and the 50S subunit. So the 30S ribosomal subunit is here in pink. Okay. And the 50S ribosomal subunit is here in green. Okay, and the mRNA is sort of um, uh, held between those two ribosomal subunits. Right, so here is the start codon, okay, and it's basically positioned in the P site of the ribosome. So the amino acyl tRNA that's bound to it, this formalmethionine tRNA with the complementary anticodon, is sitting in the P site of this ribosome. Now this second codon, which is in orange here, this second codon will be sitting in the E site, basically. Sorry, the A site, not the E site. Here's the A site. So what can happen is another uh, amino acyl tRNA can come in. So what's going to happen is another t amino acyl tRNA is going to come in, which has the complementary anticodon to the second codon. So in this case, it will be CCG, basically. C is complementary to G, and then G is complementary to C. So here comes our second amino acyl tRNA, and it will have some amino acid bound to it. I do not know off the top of my head what the combination CCG has. Uh, you can look it up on the internet. The internet will give you that answer. It will tell you exactly what amino acid should be here. But for the general principle, it doesn't matter because I just made this up. Okay, uh, so does the amino acyl tRNA come in on its own? Well, it doesn't. It comes in accompanied with another protein. So there is another protein that is bound to this amino acyl tRNA. And this is known as elongation factor TU, often just denoted TU. But this, strictly speaking, is elongation factor TU. Okay? Elongation factor TU. Now, elongation factor TU also has a molecule of guanosine triphosphate bound to it, so GTP bound to it here. Okay, so what's going to happen is this entire complex here, the amino acyl tRNA with the complementary anticodon to uh, the second codon of the mRNA and the appropriate amino acid for that anticodon um, attached to it, that the so-called amino acyl tRNA, so this bit is the amino acyl tRNA, amino acyl tRNA, okay, attached with this elongation factor TU and GTP, that's all going to come into this A site. So in it comes basically here, okay? So here's elongation factor TU with the GTP bound. Now, why does elongation factor TU come in like this? What's the point of this elongation factor TU? So let me colour it in in blue so that we know what we're looking at. Okay, so this is elongation factor TU in blue here. What is the point of this protein? Well, basically, when you have your ribosome set up like this, all sorts of amino acyl tRNAs will be coming into this A site and trying to bind their anticodons to this second codon of the mRNA, okay? And they will not have the complementary anticodon to that second codon. So they should not be allowed to bind in that A site and remain there. Because if you did allow them to bind and remain there, they would have the wrong, well, potentially the wrong amino acid bound to them. And you would put in the wrong amino acid into this protein, and that would not be good. So... TU, elongation factor TU, is really important for coming in here and checking that the amino acyl tRNA that has come in to the A site actually has a complementary anticodon to the codon that is in the A site, basically, which at the moment is the second codon. 
Okay, and if the um, anticodon is complementary to the codon that's in the A site, what will happen is that elongation factor TU uh, will hydrolyze this GTP. So this GTP will break into uh, GDP and inorganic phosphate. Okay, so now what will happen is uh, elongation factor TU here will be bound to GDP and inorganic phosphate. And now once it's bound to uh, GDP and inorganic phosphate, it lets go of uh, this amino acyl tRNA. So basically, it is there to check that uh, the amino acyl uh, tRNA that's gone into the A site is actually complementary to the codon that is in the A site and that you're not putting in incorrect uh, amino acyl tRNAs. Okay, and if it's satisfied that you have put in the correct amino acyl tRNA, then it will hydrolyze this GTP to GDP and inorganic phosphate, and elongation factor TU will then go off. Right, so we'll continue this discussion in the next video.